Welcome to the Best Weight Beyond the Scale workshop. My name is Angela. I am a registered dietitian here to facilitate this workshop, which is provided to you by the Edmonton Primary Care Networks. As part of the medical home concept of care through a family physician and the interdisciplinary services provided through Edmonton Primary Care Networks, welcome to our presentation. Let's get started. Welcome to your medical home. When you walk through our door, we get to the heart of all your healthcare needs. Your family physician is the key to your medical home and knows you best. As a member of our primary care network in Alberta, your family physician can access a dedicated team of health professionals who together can provide you with the care you need through every stage of your life. Your medical home is where you can get reliable care you can trust at any time of the day, including accessing after-hours care without having to visit the emergency department. Your medical home is also where registered nurses, pharmacists, mental health professionals, dietitians, and other health professionals work with you to keep you living your healthiest life. By managing chronic disease and offering continuous care through your family physician, with links to specialists, hospital procedures, and treatments, providing earlier detection of disease and improving access to the care you need when you need it. So welcome home. We're glad you joined us. Are you expecting to get a number or a ideal weight out of today's workshop? or hoping to get a meal plan to follow. The truth is, the internet has millions of different meal plans to choose from. If they're really working, why are we still here attending this presentation? We're here not because of a lack of knowledge in nutrition, but because there is a missing link in understanding our best weight. Therefore, we will not focus on nutrition or a specific number on the scale today, but instead, we will set you up with success in managing your weight expectation. Here's today's outline. The information of today's presentation has been adapted from the following three resources. Canadian Adult Obesity Clinical Practice Guideline 2020. Best Weight, a practice guide to office-based obesity management. Let's talk about weight, no size fit all. Throughout the presentation, I will be citing quotes from these resources in my speaker note. We will also go through a handout called My Iceberg. Oftentimes, people find it helpful to have a pen and paper ready to take some notes. If you haven't done so, please take a moment to pause the presentation and print a handout from the website so you can follow along. Weight issue may be a new concern for you, or you have tried different methods to manage weight before. Often, people with experience in weight management comment that diet and exercise do work, but they also don't work. For the purpose of today's presentation, the term weight and obesity will be used interchangeably. First of all, let us recognize that obesity is a medical condition. Weight is not a behavior. What is obesity then? It is a complex, progressive, and relapsing chronic disease characterized by abnormal and or excessive body fat that impairs health. It requires individualized treatment and long-term support. I'm going to play a video done by Dr. David Macklin. He's an expert in weight management. The video is called The Gatekeeper, The Go-Getter, and The Sleepy Executive. It helps to provide further insight into answering the question, what is obesity? This video will take about 9 minutes and 43 seconds long. Enjoy. Hi, my name is David Macklin. I'm a family physician. I've spent my entire career working in obesity medicine. I plan to answer a couple of questions today with this video. Question one, what does it mean when I say that obesity is a real medical condition? That it's mostly inherited in our genes, it's centered in the brain, and very influenced by the environment, and it gets worse over time. 
Question two, successful, effective, long-term treatment exists for people living with obesity, but what is that treatment and how does it work? Good science tells us that around 70% of the risk of struggling with obesity in our lifetime is genetic, passed down from our parents. What many don't know is that these genes, the majority of them, are in the brain. We each inherit a unique appetite system. This is where your weight gets determined and regulated. It has three layers. They're all interconnected. They're called the homeostatic system, the motivation system, and the executive system. This system evolved in an environment where calories were really scarce and finding food involved work and therefore required motivation to go and get. Our prevailing understanding of obesity and why it happens is that this ancient system has collided with our modern food environment. This ultra processed, sugar, fat, salt, taste, big portioned, everywhere, anytime, advertised to look healthy, brought to your front door environment. You might think the consequences of this collision would be complicated, but they're not. In fact, I'm gonna invite you to sit back and I'll tell you a story of how this works. And more importantly, answer these two questions. The story I will tell you is called The Gatekeeper, The Go-Getter, and The Sleepy Executive. Let's get started with The Gatekeeper. It's about time. The Gatekeeper is the first layer, the homeostatic system. Gatekeeper, tell them what you do. I defend against fat loss. The Gatekeeper does this by watching this bucket of leptin. You see, fat cells in the body produce a hormone called leptin. So weight loss results in lowering leptin levels. And he is exquisitely sensitive to dropping leptin levels. If the level in this bucket starts to go down, he sees it, gets alarmed, and bam, presses the button. He does this because to our ancestors, weight loss was never good news. They didn't lose weight to look good for a wedding. They lost weight because the food supply was interrupted. This alarm gets sent up to the next level. Gatekeeper, can you explain? This button makes him work harder. Did someone call me? Is there food? We need food. We should get food. Food? This is the go-getter. He represents the middle layer, the motivational system. He motivates us to go and get food. Remember in our former environment, the motivation to go and get food was critical. Wanting is the most common name for this motivational drive, but it's also called cravings or desire or urge or impulse. Wanting acts like a wave. It rises, it crests, and it falls. Go get her, tell them what you do. When I eat a lot of food, or really good food. This is the concept of tasty foods that are dense in calories and quick energy. The body is set up to signal our go-getter when we eat these types of survival ensuring foods. And then I learn. This is important. This system operates on a simple Pavlovian learning model. A learning takes place between these signals of food and the external settings at the moment. Look what he's writing down. Post dinner, couch, TV, coffee table, nighttime, dark windows. This is also called associative learning. And then it happens. Eventually, just these cues themselves gain the power to activate wanting, the drive to go and get. And the wanting drives excessive calorie intake and weight gain. Everything I've described so far goes on in the non-conscious parts of the brain. These things all happen without you knowing it. No actual eating decisions get made here. The go-getter just sends a wave of wanting up to the third level, the final layer, the executive system. <sighs> Did someone say executive? The sleepy executive represents the executive system. This is where all our decisions get made. What you need to know about the executive system is that it has two parts. The sleepy executive and beside him is the autopilot. The Nobel Prize winning psychologist Daniel Kahneman calls these system one and system two. This is how it works. When a wave of wanting arrives at the executive system, first the autopilot will generate thoughts that are immediate and automatic. Thoughts that are permission-like. 
thoughts that give reason why we should eat or eat more. This is called cognitive bias. Autopilot permission thoughts sound like, it's been a long day, I deserve this. I'm tired, this will give me a boost in energy. I'm on track lately, so I can. Or I'm off track lately, so what does it matter? I can have more because I exercised today. I'll have this now and I'll start again on Monday. Kahneman says that most of our decisions are made based on this type of thinking and that by nature, the sleepy executive is usually and preferably asleep. But if he is awake, he thinks differently. System two uses conscious effort, thinks slowly, deliberates, weighs the consequences. The sleepy executive is able to recognize that permission thoughts are incorrect. He can also generate his own thoughts that consider the future, thoughts that sound like, I don't really need this. I'm not hungry. I feel better if I don't. Eating this is really not in the direction of all the things that are most important to me. So there it is. This is the appetite system. Weight loss is defended against. A conditioned wave generated from underneath is shuttled up to the executive system where the autopilot convincingly describes why we should. And all we have is a sleepy executive to stand up to all of it. This system collides with the modern food environment and bam. And now you know where the differences in genetic risk are found. They're found here within these three characters. One person's gatekeeper will oppose weight loss much more strongly than someone else's. In one person, the go-getter will learn more quickly, be more sensitive to cues, and generate a taller wave of wanting. Some people's sleepy executive will be, well, sleepier. And so, obesity is a real medical condition, mostly inherited, centered in the brain, influenced by our environment, and progressive. Yeah. And now you know why. This framework answers our first question. My second question was about treatment. There are three types of treatment, and now you'll understand how they work. Behavioral therapy, medication, and surgery. You now understand that behavioral therapy is about developing skills and confidence that keep the sleepy executive as awake as possible just when he or she is most needed. Remember that the gatekeeper and the go-getter are in non-conscious parts of the brain that are inaccessible to us. We can't get there ourselves, but medication can. And so this is exactly where our best weight loss medications work. They dampen the height of the wave, making it smaller, and the go-getter becomes less active and less sensitive to cues. The gatekeeper relaxes and becomes less bothered by dropping levels of leptin. And this makes the work of the sleepy executive much easier because he's not facing a tidal wave from underneath, and weight loss and weight loss maintenance become more likely. So, would you consider that past weight loss efforts were difficult, not because of some flaw in your character or lack of strength or motivation or willpower, but instead because you are struggling, untreated, with a real medical condition? Both behavioral therapy and medications exist that are effective in treating this real medical condition. Please ask your physician for help in finding the right support for you. Thanks for listening. shapes and sizes, which is why it's important not to confuse weight with being healthy. When excess body fat is impairing a person's medical function or psychosocial health, then the person is said to have obesity. However, do not assume that every person with a larger body has a medical condition called obesity. So do I have obesity? You may have heard about the body mass index, or short for BMI. It is often used to determine if a person has obesity, assess an individual's health, or use as a personal weight goal. It is calculated based on a person's weight and height.
However, according to the new Canadian Obesity Practice Guideline 2020, BMI is not a reliable assessment tool when used alone because it fails to consider many factors that have an impact on health, such as race, gender, body frame, muscle mass, age, lifestyle, weight history, activity, etc. Therefore, the guidelines suggested that a comprehensive health history and assessment is required to identify those who will benefit from obesity treatment. As you can see from the picture on the screen, people who belong to the same BMI range can have very different body shapes and that represent different health risk. Let's look at the two people on the right hand side of the picture. They both belong to the quote-unquote obese category according to a BMI. Yet, when you do a proper health history and examine them individually, person A has lower health risk compared to person B despite having the same BMI. On the other hand, some people in the quote-unquote healthy weight category can have excess fat that impairs their health and therefore require obesity treatment. In conclusion, if the excess body fat is not impairing the health of a person, then it is to say the person does not have obesity and therefore no weight loss treatment is required but to continue with healthy lifestyle. In the same way, BMI alone is also not appropriate to be used as a personal weight goal. The goals of obesity treatment should be improved health and well-being and not just weight loss. Making better lifestyle choices can lead to a healthier you and decrease health risk, even if they don't result in weight loss. What is best weight? Even though we can lose weight by eating less and moving more, there will come a point where we can no longer downsize our food and up our exercise while still enjoying our life. So the weight that we can attain while still liking our life is our best weight. It is determined by genetics and lifestyle together. The concept of best weight has far more value than the body mass index, the ideal weight, or the waist circumference alone, because ultimately we're trying to improve our quality of life. Treating the root causes of obesity is the foundation of obesity management. It is a critical step in building an individualized treatment plan. Obesity Canada suggests four categories for potential root cause of weight gain called the 4M. Mental health, such as depression, anxiety. Mechanical, such as activity restriction, sleep disorders. Metabolic, such as heart disease, diabetes. Monetary, such as financial concern regarding medical coverage and limited grocery budget. It is important to consider your weight journey and the contributing factors before making changes in life. It is common to assume weight gain is a byproduct of overeating and lack of exercise. Therefore, the treatment logically would be the reverse, eat less and move more. Unfortunately, the weight is just the tip of the iceberg. It is a symptom of something that's much bigger and deeper underneath the sea level. Without acknowledging and treating the root causes of weight gain, it's like treating an infection by putting a band-aid on without finding the cause. After all, weight management is more than a simple math equation of calorie in and calorie out. The following activity will help you to understand your personal iceberg, to gain insight into your previous weight management attempt, and help you to decide what your future plan would be. Let's take out your copy of the handout called My Iceberg and circle all the root causes that are applicable to you as specified under the 4M. If there are some root causes that are not on your handout, feel free to add your own. If you need a couple more minutes, you're welcome to pause the presentation and restart when you're ready. When you take a look of your own personal 4Ms, would you still agree with the statement that weight loss is simply eat less and move more? The new Canadian Adult Obesity Guidelines suggest five major treatment options in managing obesity. What treatment options you need is based on your medical conditions as well as what is important to you. Nutrition therapy. Healthy eating is important for everyone, 
regardless of body size or health. However, your health is not a number on a scale. There is no one-size-fits-all healthy eating pattern for obesity management, because what works for one person may not work for you. Choose an eating pattern that supports your best health, something that can be maintained over long term. Remember that how you eat is just as important as what and how much you eat. Practice eating mindfully and build a healthy relationship with food. Physical therapy. Increasing physical activity is one of the core treatment options. It provides a wide range of health benefits, regardless of your BMI, even in the absence of weight loss. Often, when people become more active, they gain strength, range of motions, better mood, and be able to do things they couldn't before. Find something you love doing, including aerobic and resistant training. When you think about it. All obesity management interventions involve behavior, such as meal planning, activity, taking medication as prescribed. So behavioral change support should be incorporated into all kinds of management plans. The main goal of psychological and behavioral interventions is to help people to make changes that are sustainable, that promote positive self-esteem and confidence, and that improve health, function, and quality of life. There is not one pathway to success. There are many different strategies that can be helpful. Set up a goal that is important to you, not just your healthcare provider. Pharmacotherapy. Weight loss medication can be prescribed by your physician in your weight management journey, when health behavioral changes alone have not been effective or sustainable. These medications can help you to achieve and maintain a five to ten percent weight loss. And improve health complications associated with excess weight. It is not recommended to use prescription or over-the-counter medications other than those approved for weight management. Bariatric surgery. These types of surgeries involve making changes to your digestive system to promote weight loss. It has different surgical options with different levels of effectiveness. In combination with behavioral interventions. Bariatric surgery is often considered for people living with severe obesity, and/or severe obesity-related diseases not responding to medical treatment, such as poorly controlled type two diabetes and sleep apnea. It requires referral to a specialty clinic, and there's criteria to select appropriate candidates. Now that you have a better understanding of the different obesity treatment options, take a look of your handout, my iceberg again. Reflect on your root causes of weight gain, and decide what type of treatment options can help address your need. There are different healthcare professionals that specialize in each of these area. They can help you develop an individualized plan and provide ongoing support. Talk to your family doctor in your medical home for a referral. Before you commit on a treatment plan to manage your weight, ask yourself these two important questions and answer with brutal honesty. Am I enjoying the approach or just tolerating it to get a result? Tolerance is like a visit from a relative. You're happy to see them, but their welcome has an expiry date. At some point, you want to go back to your normal life. On the other hand, a weight management method that is enjoyable is something that you love so much that you look forward to doing it every single day. Second question: Can I do this for the rest of my life? If you want the weight loss result to stay, whatever you do to achieve the outcome needs to stay as well. Think of it like laundry. The moment you stop doing it, that's the moment the dirty clothes start to pile up. And that's why the first question is so crucial, because you're more likely to do it your whole life when it is enjoyable. Even though diets lead to short-term success with weight loss, there's actually a 95% failure rate for most diets. Shocking, right? According to research highlighted within the latest obesity guideline, calorie restriction can achieve reductions in weight over short term, or less than twelve months, but has not been shown to be sustainable long term, or more than twelve months. Caloric restriction may affect brain pathways that control appetite, hunger, cravings, and body weight regulation that may result in increased food intake and weight gain. Is our body failing us when the weight is regained? Quite the opposite. Evolution biology is designed in a way to revert weight loss. 
When food intake decreases, various body signals and neurotransmitters will work simultaneously to protect the weight. Our bodies are not failing us when we regain the weight after a diet. In fact, they are working just the way it is intended by following millions of years of evolution biology. The booklet "Let's Talk About Weight: No Size Fit All" has a paragraph on page eleven that nicely summarizes the yo-yo weight cycling experience, and this is what it says: While going on a restrictive diet can result in rapid or drastic weight loss, it can also slow down your metabolism in a significant way. Not only can a slower metabolism and feelings of deprivation can have a negative impact on your weight, but the weight loss can also increase your appetite. When this happens, you're likely to give up, start eating as before, and even experience binge eating and put back on the weight that you lost, and possibly more, which will make you want to restrict your diet all over again. And so your weight goes down, and then up. And then down, and then up, just like a yo-yo. If you would like to take a look of this booklet, it is posted on the PCM website where you find this presentation. It is also listed on the reference page at the end of this PowerPoint. This yo-yo weight cycling is so frustrating that some people wish they have a time machine to go back and not start the dieting, because at least their current weight is not higher than their initial weight. If your weight management journey does not show a yo-yo pattern, let's learn to prevent it from happening. I'm going to play a video done by Dr. Arya Sharma, another expert in obesity management. The video is called "How to Lose 50 Pounds and Keep It Off." It will help further explain the chronicity of obesity. It takes about 10 minutes long. Enjoy. I practice medicine at a center that specializes in the treatment of obesity. The people who come to see us have all struggled with excess weight for a long time. And many of them have severe health problems. They have diabetes. They have heart disease. They have bone and joint problems, and that's different from one to the next. But there's one thing that all of our patients have in common. And that is that they've all lost weight before. Not once, not twice. Over and over again, because every time they lose weight, the weight just comes back. And it doesn't matter how hard they struggle. It doesn't matter what diet they go on. It doesn't matter what exercise program they follow. It doesn't matter whether they lose the weight fast or slow. The weight always comes back. And so, by the time that I get to see them, they feel like they're the biggest losers. And they ask me, Dr. Sharma, there must be something wrong with me. There must be something wrong with my metabolism. Every time I lose weight, it comes back. Now I know that my patients are not alone with this problem. Let me ask you: Is there anybody here who's ever lost weight? Come on, be honest. Yeah. Has anybody put it back on again? Yeah. It's almost everybody, because we know that out of 20 people who go out and lose weight, it doesn't matter how they do it, 19 are going to put the weight back on. And so the question is, why is this so difficult? You know, why is losing weight one thing, but keeping it off is where the real struggle is? Now we understand that there's a complex neurobiology. That regulates our body weight, and we understand that this complex neurobiology also defends us against weight loss. And it's complex. You know, this is not calories in, calories out. That's that's physics. You know, I'm talking physiology. And the way that I think about physiology is, it's your biology messing with physics. And so, for a long time, I was looking for a way. How do I explain this to my patients? How do I get my patients to understand what they're really up against every time they go out and try and lose weight? And that's what I want to show you today. I want to show you what it actually takes to lose 50 pounds and keep them off. 
And to help me with this demonstration, I'd like to welcome Alex here to the stage. And she just volunteered uh, before my talk. She doesn't know what's awaiting her. Give her a warm welcome here. Thank right, you, Alex. Step forward. All right, so Alex, here's what I want you to do. I want you to take this one end of this band and the other end so that you can hold it like this, OK? All right, why don't you just do that? Yeah, that's good. OK. Yeah, it's maybe a little bit optimistic. OK. <laughs> one more. All right, fine. And now I want you to hold it like this, OK? All right, good. So what I want you to picture is this is, this is Alex's weight. And it's 250 pounds. And I have no idea how Alex got to be 250 pounds. This could be genetics. Maybe she's an emotional leader. Maybe she has a stressful job. Maybe it's not enough sleep because she works shifts. Maybe, and I hope not, it's PTSD, depression. Maybe Alex is on medications that make her hungry all the time. It doesn't matter. Because anybody who's put on weight is going to be up exactly the same problem that Alex is up against. So Alex, you ready to lose 50 pounds? Yeah. All right, great. So I'm sure that out there, you're going to have a couple of suggestions for her. What are the things that she could possibly do to try to get some of that weight off? Exercise. How much exercise do you think? She, what's your recommendation? 30 minutes a day. 30 minutes a day. You can do 30 minutes a day? All right. So she's going to start doing 30 minutes of exercise a day. And guess what? She's starting to get thinner here. What else? Eat Pardon me? Eat healthy. Eat healthy. OK. Maybe cut her calories a little bit, right? Maybe f cut her calories by 500. That's good. That's working. What else could she do? Get better sleep, yep. We learn a lot about sleep. See? She's getting skinny. Right there. She's losing weight in front of our eyes. And I, you know what? I look at that, I say, you know, that's maybe 50 pounds. Great. So what does Alex now have to do to keep the weight off? No, she just needs to keep pulling on the rubber band. That's all. OK, so you just keep pulling, and that's how you're going to keep the weight off. Because here's the thing. See, see I don't know how she got to 250 pounds. It doesn't matter, but she's up against the same challenge that anybody's up against who's put on weight and is going to try to lose it. Because what you're seeing here, that tension in that rubber band, that's her body trying to get the weight back. And the body's got lots of tricks. That neurophysiology we talked about, it's increasing her appetite, it's slowing her metabolism, and in fact, even her muscles gets more fuel efficient. So she can, now that she's lost the weight, she can do the same amount of exercise, but burn fewer calories. And so the tension you see, that's just her body wanting the calories, wanting the body weight back. And she's going to have to keep pulling on that. And she's doing a great job. We're just going to let her stand there and keep pulling. Because, <laughs> because you see, that's the problem. The problem is, right now, there's about a billion people in this world, men, women, children, living with obesity. And we don't have a cure. Now, I wish that we, we even had some way to prevent this from happening in the first place. But even if, we, if you get the prevention going, that's still not going to help the people who have the problem. And all the people who have the problem, you know, they're going to try to lose weight, going to diet, they're going to exercise. And most of them are going to put the weight back on. Alex, how are you doing? Great. <laughs> so. I know this is depressing. <laughs> yeah, you guys are getting depressed. You know, my patients get very depressed when I tell them this. And I'm very depressed. But when I look at this, you know, I, you know, I just see another chronic disease. Now, I look at my patients with diabetes. You know, they come in. She's putting some of that weight back on already. <laughs> you know, my patients with diabetes come in. You know, we start them off on diet, they do their exercise, they take their medication, you know, check their blood sugars, come in for regular checkups, and guess what? The blood sugar levels go down, and the risk for, diabetes, for, for heart disease and all the complications goes down. It's great. But guess what happens when they come off their diet? Guess what happens when they stop their exercise, or they stop their medication, or they stop coming in for visits? Blood sugar goes back up. All the problems come back. 
I look at my patients with high blood pressure. It's the same story. You know, they come in, they start their low-salt diet, they start their exercise program, they take their medications, they check their blood pressure levels. They come in for regular visits. We bring the blood pressure down. Great. Reduces their risk for heart attacks and strokes. Now, guess what happens when they stop exercising, when they come off their diet, they come off their medications? Guess what? Risk goes back up. That's chronic disease. Every chronic disease, you stop the treatment, that's what happens. The disease comes back. And obesity, you stop the diet, you stop the exercise, you stop taking your medications, you get your bariatric surgery undone, guess what? Weight's coming back. And that is exactly why the Canadian Medical Association, the American Medical Association, they've all now come up and said, you know, once you have obesity, you've got to look at it as a chronic disease because it behaves like a chronic disease. It's not about shame or blame. It's about accepting the fact that the problem you're up against is like the same problem that anybody's up against who has a chronic disease. And so what I tell my patients and what I want to tell you today, if you yourself or someone you care about has obesity, tell them to get professional help. Tell them to get help from a doctor, from a nurse, from a dietitian, from anybody who's trained as a health professional to manage chronic disease. Because the principles of chronic disease management, they are well known. They're established. Patient education, self-management, regular monitoring, regular checkups, coming up with a realistic treatment plan that you can actually stay on. And we do that for patients who have diabetes. We do that for people living with heart disease. We do that for people living with high blood pressure. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is exactly what we need to be doing for people living with obesity. Thank you so much, and give her a big hand. Thank you. The video we just saw reinforces that obesity is a chronic condition. Successful weight management requires for a long-term strategy. Relapse or weight regain is virtually inevitable when treatment is stopped. Now we're going to move on to plateau. Plateau is actually normal. Remember that your body's job is to survive by storage? Plateau is a sign that your body's working because continuous and unstoppable weight loss usually is the first sign that there's something wrong with the body. So what causes a plateau? As a person's body becomes smaller, it also burns fewer calories and will reach a plateau where the weight is stable. Once you've reached a plateau, ask yourself, can I make additional changes and still enjoy my life? For example, could I eat fewer calories and still enjoy my life? Could I exercise any more and still enjoy my life? Can I manage my stress better? Can I get better sleep? If the answer is yes to any of the above, it is a plateau. Typical plateau could last several weeks to several months. Be prepared because there are more than one plateau during the journey. You can imagine it as going downstairs. On the other hand, if you don't think you can make additional changes and still enjoy your life, and your weight has already been stable for six to eight weeks, then you've likely reached a floor where no further weight loss is likely to occur. And this is your best weight. This is the weight that a person can achieve and maintain while still living their healthiest and happiest life. So stabilize your best weight and continue to focus on improving your well-being, body functions, and quality of life. How much weight loss can be expected? Instead of solely using BMI to implicit weight loss and determine weight loss goal, it is recommended to use a comprehensive approach to look at weight-related health problems, mental health, and quality of life. Do you really need to lose weight? If so, which strategies are appropriate for you? Let's take a look at the table on the screen. If your weight currently has no impact on your health at all, then no obesity treatment is required other than prevention of weight gain. Weight stabilization is warranted. An example would be a person in the late 20s, weight is stable, but would like to lose 10 pounds for the upcoming vacation. In this case, weight loss is not indicated. If your weight currently has mild impact on your health, lifestyle treatment is recommended to prevent further weight gain and 5-10% to of weight loss. An example would be a person with borderline high blood pressure and slight back pain, knee pain related to their weight. 
A common misconception is that 5 to 10 percent weight loss is too small to be significant. However, research has shown that people achieving a weight loss of 5 to 10 percent of their initial weight will experience a reduction in heart disease and diabetes risk. These weight loss outcomes may vary from person to person. They're meant to provide a realistic expectation when lifestyle is the recommended treatment. If your weight currently has moderate to severe impact on your health, then a combination of lifestyle, medication, and possibly bariatric surgery might be indicated. An example would be a person with a few advanced medical conditions, such as poorly controlled type 2 diabetes, severe sleep apnea, heart attack, stroke, disabling arthritis, severe depression, diabetes kidney disease, Weight loss medications when used in addition to medical nutrition therapy and physical activity can produce an additional average weight loss of 5 to 15 percent depending on the drugs and the dosing. Bariatric surgery in combination with health behavioral modification can result in significant long-term weight loss, up to 20 to 40 percent of your body weight. In some cases, even complete remission of obesity-related diseases, including type 2 diabetes, sleep apnea, fatty liver disease, and hypertension. However, weight loss results vary from person to person, as it depends on the type of treatment combination you and your healthcare provider decided on, and how your body responds to it. Take a moment to think about your weight's relationship to your health. Is it no impact, mild, or moderate to severe? Is weight loss indicated? If so, which treatment is recommended. Calculate the weight loss outcome based on your highest adult weight. Is the outcome aligned with your expectation? When we have mismatched weight loss expectations with the chosen strategies, it is going to be a recipe for disappointment, even though you might have already met the goals by the treatment standard. Weight expectation. Often, we're so focused on losing weight we lose sight of the things that we're doing so well already, such as stopping the yo-yo dieting cycle. It's important to remember that preventing further weight gain is an accomplishment in itself. Stable weight is better than up and down weight for our physical and mental health. You've heard the saying, slow and steady wins the race. It's not a competition. It's not about how fast and how much you lost but rather if you're able to maintain the behavior and treatment plan in an enjoyable and sustainable fashion. If weight loss is faster than two pounds per week continuously, you might be losing too much muscle mass, thereby jeopardizing metabolism. Ups and downs are normal. Remember that your weight can fluctuate from morning to night, even a few pounds from one day to the next. Beside the fat mass, When you step on the scale, you're also weighing your organs, your muscles, fluid, etc. Things like your digestive process and your hydration level, hormonal status, all play a factor to your weight. Just like looking at the stock market, it's better to look at the weight trend over a longer period of time than focusing on the day-to-day variation. Checking your weight too often can lead to unnecessary discouragement and fall into the trap of restriction cycle like yo-yo dieting. When you accept your best weight, you're more likely to reduce self-bias and in turn accept and appreciate your body. Appreciate the concept of health at every size. Because there is a wide range of healthy weights and sizes that people can be healthy and have high quality of life. Are you ready to make a change? If so, Consider choosing a behavior that speaks to your core values to improve your health and well-being. After all, your health is not a number on a scale. Often people think of weight or health management like climbing the Mount Everest, and success is only when you reach the top. If that's true, then you will likely miss the whole experience and not feeling very happy along the way. Instead of a mountain, think of weight and health management like a journey and we don't know where it leads us. So we just do our best every day and enjoy the scenery along the way. Therefore, it will be helpful to establish mini successes that you can look forward to. Set value-based goal that matters to you.
For example, when you're more fit, you get to walk up a flight of stairs without huffing and puffing. When you have better mobility, you get to climb in and out of the bathtub with more confidence. Spend some time to write down your own personal measures of success in weight management that are related to health and quality of life, something that is beyond the scale and clothing size. Although it is tempting to try to get rid of all the root causes once and for all, however, it is actually more realistic to pick only one root cause to address at a time. Start small. A journey of a thousand miles begins with one single step. Get support. Instead of being reactive, be proactive before challenges arise. Knowing ahead who is in your support team can help you feel prepared when challenges occur. Who do you want to be in your support team? Beside family and friends, it is recommended to seek professional help in managing a chronic condition like obesity. Resources and programs. Check out your own primary care network's website for a list of health workshops. Some workshops might be available virtually, while others as in person. You're also welcome to get a referral from your PCN family doctor to set up an appointment with a health professional, such as registered dietitian, exercise specialist, behavioral health consultant, social worker, etc. Refer to the handout My Iceberg and think about which clinician would be best suited to your needs at this moment. Alberta Health Services also has a variety of health workshops. Call the booking line number or check out the Alberta Health Services website for the latest information on workshops and registrations. If you would like to explore the bariatric surgery option, please talk to your family doctor to see if it is an appropriate choice for you. In closing, here are the references this workshop is based on. They are also posted on the PCM website where you find this presentation. Thank you for attending Best Weight Beyond the Scale workshop. Your medical home is here to work with you to take care of your healthcare needs. Have a wonderful day.